and I knew if I could perform well there, perhaps win the promotion, I'd have a chance to uh, to move up into management. Mm -hmm. And when I saw my first, uh, the quota that I had for that, I saw there was no way I could hit it. And then I thought about something I'd read in one of these books. So I set a new quota for myself beyond the one I felt that I probably couldn't hit and achieved that. And it was all because of an idea that I got from one of these books that I put into practice that allowed me to do that. Welcome to Success Insider, a podcast for emerging leaders and anyone seeking motivation, inspiration, and business or career advancement. Brought to you by Success Magazine. Listen, learn, grow. The famous playwright and politician Joseph Addison once said, reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. So on this week's episode, we focus on the power of the written word. Josh and Shelby talk about the power of a good book with fellow success team member Ross Crego, and we bring you the article from our August issue of Success called Live Like Carnegie, a month of winning friends and influencing people. Plus, we highlight some of the best and most popular personal development books out there. And now our hosts, Shelby Skirhawk and Josh Ellis. a whispering snake. <laughs> Hi, Josh. How are you? Oh, whew, pretty. Hmm. Usually we have this natural intro sort of scripted out a little bit, but Shelby, I didn't prepare much today. Um, mm-hmm. Off to a hot start. Hey, Shelby, have you read any good books lately? Hey, have I ever? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in light of all of the John Wooden goings on around here at Success, uh, I've certainly flipped through quite a few of of his books, one in particular, um, the one that was co-written with Don Yeager. Good, good stuff there. How about you? Yeah. uh, Well, the last one I read was Modern Romance by Aziz Ansari. Um, It was a really fun look at uh, millennial dating habits. Mm -hmm. Very interesting where to find out that, you know, a few generations ago, people basically married someone that grew up on their block or on their same, you know, in their same uh, building if they lived in a city. Uh, now people are a lot more picky. It was very interesting. Yeah. So I think that we just proved something here, didn't we? Yeah, and, I think our, our little playlet or <laughs> our short scene or Yes, or short this act. is a little bit more <laughs> scripted than... Uh, Maybe we're just not that very good of actors. We're really not. But it does prove that the books are uh, an incredible thing to talk about. So because I think we all will feel a good connection, a deep connection to something that we're reading. Or, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be reading it. It would be a textbook or something for school and just flip through a few chapters. Or, we, yeah, we would have tossed it after a couple of chapters. Uh, but, you know, books are so powerful. And I, I was joking with someone recently at a uh, magazine conference that I was at, uh, and he worked at a luxury lifestyle magazine. I was I was saying, man, you, you must get a lot of cool stuff in the mail, like yeah. sterling silver, uh, you know, cutlery and, and <laughs> stuff like that. I, I, I And delicious, uh, all the best um, Pepperidge Farm meat, or what's that? Yeah, Pepperidge Farm. What's the what's the one at the holidays that Hickory Farms? Hickory. You just got Hickory oh, Farm Pepper's stuff Farm flowing the- in all all year long. Yes. Or right. if you're fancy, Harry and David. Wow. Oh, are they the one that send those pears yes. that we yes. had last year? Awesome. Yeah. Those were good. Well, I'm sure that he has that stuff all the time. And he said, "Yeah, it's pretty nice, but what we get here." You know, magazines, you get a lot of free stuff in the mail. What we get here are books, right? We, <laughs> we, 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 Pat, we're thought leaders and we get books. You know, it's a funny joke to, to say, let's trade, but I don't know if deep down if I would trade with him because we get personal development books here and they are so powerful and full of this life wisdom to, to pretty much help anyone build the life or career or business that they want. And then, they can just buy all those luxury items and all that, all those fancy pears and Hickory Farms meats and cheese platters. <laughs> if you if you build what you the life you want, the career you want, then you can go buy those things yourself. Yes, it was way easier. Yeah, well, it's that's certainly true that personal development books are incredible tools, and and our readers really do have a deep appreciation for them. I mean, that's that's what we're talking about today. Yep. We are going to talk about some of the greatest personal development books of all time. 
and look deeply at one of those classics with a word from our writer, Tony Reagan, who tried to live like Dale Carnegie in the great book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Plus, we'll hear from a great author of our own, the Success Magazine leadership editor, John Addison himself. But first, we're talking to one of the biggest fans of the genre that uh, we certainly know. Uh, He's Ross Crago, Vice President of Sales here at Success Partners. They're the parent company publisher of Success. And he literally is the biggest consumer of personal development of anyone in the office. And that by, you know, just virtue of which office we're talking about, I would imagine that makes him one of the biggest consumers of personal development content anywhere. Yeah, because Everybody here. I mean, that, that's it's very much a personal development minded company. Mm-hmm. People really, really uh, believe in that power. So that that is saying a lot. And and I think that the wisdom that he's gotten from those books. I mean, it's pretty pretty crucial in sales to always be improving. But also, he and his wife Robin, you know, they've they've built a business that allowed them to to live these books and help promote them and teach them and really see firsthand the positive impact that this materials had in in the lives of the people in their organization. So Ross certainly knows a little something about the subject and can explain what makes these books so powerful. Ross, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So we're talking books today, personal development books. Can you describe your interest uh, originally in personal development books? Where, Where does it come from? How did it start? Uh, what do you think you're getting out of them? Well, I think for me, it started back, uh, you know, while I was still at home going to school and saw my father reading books like this and uh, saw the incredible man that, uh, that he was and the relationships he had with people. So that seed was planted at that time. And uh, I probably didn't really get into uh, reading personal development books on a regular basis until I had got into the business world. And the books for me there made a, made a huge difference. I think the skills that we learn in college or whatever training we might have uh, teach us how to do that particular job. We can function and, and, and do what uh, we're asked to do. But I think it's those soft skills that allow us to level that playing field and actually uh, move towards our, our, our true potential. I think back early in my uh, business career, of course, I was a young man wanting to uh, to move up into management, etc. And uh, there was I was in a sales organization, and there was a national sales uh, promotion that came up. And I knew if I could perform well there, perhaps win the promotion, I'd have a chance to uh, to move up into management. Mm-hmm. And when I saw my first uh, the quota that I had for that, I saw there was no way I could hit it. And then I thought about something I'd read in one of these books. And so what I did is I said, well, that's not my goal. My goal is to win this. So I set a new quota for myself beyond the one I felt that I probably couldn't hit and achieved that. And it was all because of an idea that I got from one of these books that I put into practice that allowed me to do that. Shelby, didn't this idea come up in a meeting we were in this morning? An education will make you a living, but uh, working on yourself is what will make you a fortune. Yep. The great Jim Rohn. That's right. Yeah. So what was that book that, uh, that made the difference? Uh, that book was uh, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. A Holy classic, no. obviously. Excellent. What makes a book a good personal development book? To me, it's simplicity, where you have a, and, and be, the things that, that really help you grow and become more typically are simple things. So uh, the simpler it's expressed, the better. It doesn't have to be uh, some complex, complicated, many pages to describe an idea. In fact, in a good personal development book, you should be able to read 10 minutes or 10 pages. Uh, in fact, I recommend that every day before you, before you retire for the night. And within that 10 pages or 10 minutes, you're going to find an idea that's going to resonate with you and that you're probably going to be able to uh, either think a little bit more about that or put it into action the next day. Well, that's a neat idea to put that into practice before you go to bed because you know that your mind keeps working even after your body has adjourned for the day. And so putting some of those those seeds, planting some of those seeds in your mind, I think are a, a great practice there. You mentioned simplicity, and I think that part of what simplicity does in a personal development book is it allows the content to be applicable 
to almost anyone, whether you're in sales like you are or you're an entrepreneur or you're like you or I, Shelby, where, where we're in media. Um, no matter what your job is or what phase of life you're in, the principles really are, are span, you know, any gap. They work for everybody. And we talk quite a bit about this, I think. You know, in some ways, personal development is really the reinforcement of the obvious. They're practical lessons that we all know deep down. I think that's partially true. Well, I, or I should say that's part of the, of the overall um, concept here. Part of it is reinforcing things we've already been taught or we've learned, depending on where we grow up, what we've been exposed to. Um, but there's also a lot of things out there that, uh, that we don't know. Uh, when I first uh, started reading personal development books, one of the most influential books I had initially served the first purpose, and that was a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. And, you know, we all grow up thinking that the way I think is the right way to think, especially if you have my personality, <laughs> right? Um, but we all think that, you know, however it is we think, that's the right way. But when I read that book, The Magic of Thinking Big, as I read each of the things there, it helped give me confirmation that, yes, I was on the right track. And you all know when we have confirmation like that, that gives us more confidence to, to proceed and go forward. But then I think there's also a big section here that, depending on where we grew up, what we did, there's a lot of information, powerful information, that we don't get exposed to. And it's kind of like, you know, there's a lot of things I know, there's a lot of things I know that I don't know, and then there's many, 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 many more things that I don't know that I don't know, right? So I think when we come across this type of content, we get exposed to some of those things. You just mentioned the great Jim Rohn. And, uh, you know, Jim, of course, probably has influenced more than anyone else uh, out there uh, that I'm aware of, you know, in this whole area. So one of the things that, uh, that Jim shared early on is that we can have more because we can become more. And, of course, the key to that is first we must become more to have more. So many people going through life that get frustrated with where they are in life and, you know, why can't I get ahead? Why can't I, you know, uh, make more money or have more friends or whatever it is? And if they just think about what Jim has said here and realize, you know what, I've got to grow first before that's going to happen. I've got to become the person that can attract people more than I do today. I've got to become the person who can uh, bring more value so that I can make more. So to me, that was, that was terrific. And I think it's a great message of hope for people because no matter where you are in life, I mean, if you choose to, that can all change. And the reason it can change is because you can become more. So you're obviously very well read in personal development books and, and, and really a wide variety of books. Have you ever thought about writing one of those books? And uh, if so, what would it be? Actually, I've never thought about writing one. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the challenge is we need more mm -hmm. personality books. Uh, I think what we really need is an awareness that there is such a thing where we can read things and improve who we are, where we can become more. And uh, as Jim Rohn has said, they're not making any new antiques. Mm -hmm. Right? The principles are the principles are the principles. I think the different books, you know, may take one of those principles and explain it perhaps in a different way um, or, or may simplify it more from what it had been originally expressed. But uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing is to, is to make people aware of the fact that these exist and that they can benefit tremendously from, uh, from reading them. You know, you mentioning that you kind of got this great habit uh, of reading these books from your dad, from seeing him read them. And John Maxwell, of course, our columnist and the great leadership author, uh, he's talked frequently about his dad paid him an allowance based on whether he read one of these books. And so uh, allow me, the only person in the room who does not have children, to make that, <laughs> uh, that parenting advice for any of our listeners that... What a great thing to instill in your kids. You know, I think the, um, one of the greatest lessons that we can take from this whole genre of books is that we can become more. 
we don't have to be just where we are in the world today, who we are in the world today. Uh, we can actually design what we want our future to be, no matter where we are, no matter what the circumstances are or the situation. I think if people will engage in these types of books, they're going to find the nuggets, they're going to find the things that will help them, and they'll be guided to take action. I mean, you can sit around all day and think about your challenge and and think about the situation you're in, but once you come across information like this that can help you move on, you've got to take action with it. And uh, so I think this is a powerful way for people to become the most that individual can become. We're not in competition with each other, right? Our challenge in life is how do I become the best me that I can be? Great advice, great wisdom. Awesome thoughts, Ross. Thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure, thank you. Hi, I'm Tony Rehagen from St. Louis, and my first article for success is called Live Like Carnegie, A Month of Winning Friends and Influencing People. Let's just say I know Aubrey. Apple Store employees don't wear name tags, but I remember that name. That moniker and the wiry young man with thick glasses that belonged to it were the unwitting foci of my frustration and anger three weeks ago, the last time I was sitting here at the so-called Genius Bar. Aubrey was the so-called genius who told me in some esoteric techie dialect that my old MacBook was out of memory or washer fluid or whatever, that three years of work I had failed to back up was essentially lost, and that I was a moron. Okay, I said that last part, but he didn't argue. Well, now I'm back, snarling for a fight after having been cast into the next door Macy's for more than an hour, waiting to be paged. My brand new MacBook won't start, and I'm certain that almost a month's worth of unbacked up work is gone and my life and career are over. And Aubrey, of all name tagless messengers, once again drew the short straw. After a few minutes of poking and prodding the machine, he tells me that it might just be my display on the fritz, that all my data might be safe. But the only way to know, says Aubrey, is to plug the laptop into an external display. And the only one, says Aubrey, in this whole entire computer store is currently being used by an hour-long Apple Watch tutorial. I'm ready to blow when certain words come rushing back to me. Give honest and sincere appreciation, I think. I hear the imagined Midwestern accent of Dale Carnegie reciting the second tenet of his fundamental techniques in handling people, the first section of his best-selling 1936 field Bible for relationships, How to Win Friends and Influence People, a building block for so much of the personal development content that has come since. Appreciation is one of the most powerful tools in the world, the passage reads. People will rarely work at their maximum potential under criticism, but honest appreciation brings out their best. It reminds me to take a breath and consider Aubrey. While I was waiting, I had observed him floating between customers, effortlessly untangling the power cable of one patron's computer as he talked someone else through an iPhone issue, somehow paying attention to both. Both had walked away smiling, their problems apparently resolved. When he came to me, he knew my machine intimately, had an instinct for what the simplest explanation for its malady might be, and had a check. It occurs to me that while I have been furious with one person for being so calm while my world is crashing, he must be dealing with dozens of frustrated, frantic people like me every day. And yet he is reassuring, and he doesn't talk down to me. He's really good at his job. Look, I know you deal with idiots like me all day, I say. I can't imagine what it's like trying to solve a billion little crises one after another. I honestly don't know how you do it. My problem isn't your fault. If anything, it's my fault for not backing up my work. In fact, maybe you could help me with that once we get the machine working. Aubrey and I start up a little conversation. He tells me he enjoys helping people, but eventually wants to move up to a more supervisory role. In fact, he says, he has an interview for a higher position later today. I tell him it must be hard to focus on troubleshooting these little glitches with that event on the horizon. He smiles, shrugs off the notion, and mentions that he might be able to find another monitor in the back that can help us solve my problem. The assignment was simple. Read how to win friends and influence people, then live by its advice for an entire month. My initial reaction was one of incredulity. Of course I knew the book, which has sold more than 30 million copies worldwide and was one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential nonfiction books of all time. But I've never been into the self-improvement genre. It's not that I'm perfect. I've just never thought to read an 80-year-old tome penned by a motivational speaker who died during Eisenhower's first term. There were grounds for skepticism. First of all, the material is a bit dated. Even after a second edition was released in the 1980s, leaving out the original sections of letter writing for miraculous results and on marriage advice, the updated book comes off as a bit antiquated in places. For instance, the chapter suggesting that effective leaders use praise to sugarcoat criticism begins with an anecdote of President Calvin Coolidge telling one of his secretaries, that's a pretty dress you're wearing this morning, and you are a very attractive young woman, before admonishing her for poor punctuation. 
In 2011, Dale Carnegie and Associates, Inc., which carries on the author's teachings and training courses, put out a complete reboot, How to Win Friends and Influence People in the Digital Age, with a 21st century spin on advice and anecdotes. The second reservation I had was that I knew the book had been critically skewered through the years as a guide for manipulating people. But Carnegie evidently anticipated such cynicism. In the second chapter of the book, he explains, one comes from the heart out, the other from the teeth out. One is unselfish, the other selfish. One is universally admired, the other universally condemned. No, 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 I am not suggesting flattery. I'm talking about a new way of life. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Might sound like common sense until you consider that one, How to Win Friends was revolutionary in its time, practically inventing the genre of self-improvement books. And two, when you reflect on your own daily interactions, the idea of taking a moment to sincerely appreciate where your counterpart is coming from isn't all that common. At least that was the case with me. And among the corny expressions, bear oil, and dusty stories about William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson, I found real nuggets that I put to use almost immediately. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. This one is a parenting must. When my four-year-old failed to put her dirty clothes in the hamper, I didn't yell this time. I bit my lip and told her she did such a good job putting away her toys that she just had to do the same thing with her shirt and pants. If a desired outcome seems like a momentous task, people will give up and lose heart, Carnegie writes. But if a fault seems easy to correct, they will readily jump at the opportunity to improve. And I was sure to praise every improvement when she finally did it two weeks later. Whenever we argue with someone, no matter if we win or lose the argument, we still lose, he writes. He was obviously married. During this assignment, my wife and I happened to be buying a new house, and we had the occasion to meet the sellers at the property after we had come to terms. Haggling over the price had been a little contentious, and the inspection even more so. Still, I made it a point to smile and begin in a friendly way, as Carnegie instructs. I offered the sellers a firm handshake and a sincere appreciation for how they kept up the property. I was a good listener as they talked about improvements they'd made the place, picking up a few tips to store away for myself. I talked in terms of the other person's interest. In this case, one of the sellers mentioned the herb garden she had planted, and my wife and I followed her on a tour of the yard as she enthusiastically pointed out the tarragon, rosemary, and sage that we'll now know to harvest. Carnegie also implores us to make the other person feel important, and do it sincerely. Before we left, we asked for the inside scoop on the neighborhood, and the sellers immediately spilled the names of the plumber down the street, two auto mechanics we could trust, and the best off-the-menu Mexican food in the zip code. More than any specific tip, however, a quick read at 276 pages of this book was a reminder that the key to being a human among humans is to always stop and consider the other person's feelings and perspectives. The only way to break down any barrier between you and someone else is through mutual understanding, and it often has to start with you. So back at the Apple Store, when I cork my internal tirade and recognize Aubrey, my only chance at computer salvation must be sick of my crap. I genuinely sympathize. I empathize. I try to connect on a human level. And when he returns from the back room with a newly rigged monitor, he quickly plugs it into my MacBook and establishes it is indeed just a faulty display and that all my files are fine. He indulges my paranoia and patiently waits while I back up my crucial data to a thumb drive just in case. He tells me my machine will be ready in three business days. I thank him and wish him luck on his interview that afternoon. As I leave, I'm happy, not only about my computer and files and the fact that the machine is still under warranty and the repair will be free, but that I might have made Aubrey's day a little bit easier. I sincerely hope Aubrey's boss recognizes and appreciates his skills. I sincerely hope he gets that promotion. And after I get my laptop back, I sincerely hope I never see Aubrey again. Josh, so we're back and we've mm-hmm. got an article to talk about and it's probably the most successful or uh, at least highly trafficked article in the history of success.com. And that is 25 Books for Success. Pretty straightforward title, huh? Uh, yeah, I can see some SEO value to that title. Definitely. Uh, you get the top spot there. Uh, And what you see is what you get with this one. We've talked already today about the top three here on this list. They are How to Win Friends and Influence People, The Richest Man in Babylon, and Think and Grow Rich. What else do we have here? We've got 21 more, and we won't go through all of them, but in a lot of cases, these are the classics. You know, some of them are from 100, 110 years ago. Right. Others are more... Uh, more recent, but that really shows you what uh, you know what powerhouses they are. Because a hundred years from now, those books will be you know still be being talked about because 
It's the great thing about personal development books is the lessons are timeless. So you got one? So one of the ones we talk about is Jim Collins' Good to Great, why some companies make the leap and others don't. Um, So this one basically says that if good is the enemy of great, can good companies become great? This is something that I think a lot of people have probably referenced. You've heard uh, putting the right people on the bus. Yeah. The premise is, is that, you know, getting the right team in place, putting the right people there, that someone may be great at at X, but if your mission and your destination is Y, then that's probably not the, they may be in the right place. So here in the article, we describe a little bit about it. It says five years of investigation uncovered the characteristics that made uncommonly great companies outshine their competition and, and significantly, you know, earn higher profits. Uh, they compare the differentiating traits of good companies and great, and they learned, among other things, that leaders who willingly work with their heads and their hearts rather than their egos, that's the differentiator in making their company great. So such leaders create the foundation for the culture and sustainable results that propel an organization to be great, to be excellent, to make that difference. Yeah, over the last 15, 20 years, Jim Collins is probably one of the two or three most impactful writers of business books that there are. Uh, he's, he's had a couple huge successes, and that's that's the biggest one. Two-time success cover guy, you know? Yeah. And this was before I was here, and I know you were working on the website then, but actually both times he's like rock climbing on the cover. <laughs> I don't know why the second time they didn't come up with a different idea. But right. They're like, this one works so well the first time. Let's go back to it. Yep. Um, how about this one? Um, See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar. Zig, of course, is no longer with us, but this is probably his masterpiece published in 1975. And the message is pretty simple. There's room for you at the top. Zig's message uh, inspired millions of people to, to change their lives by helping them do and be and and have more than than they dared to dream possible. And in the book, he offers sort of a nuts and bolts approach to developing the self-image, the the attitudes, the habits that make people successful. And you read it and, and you learn how to set and achieve goals and create momentum that propels you forward in life. And and you learn why being focused on others is a critical aspect of success. It actually, we have that quote adorning the wall here, don't we? Yeah. Um, It's just a a step-by-step guide that can help you excel in every area of your life. Well, and of course, his son, Tom, is is continuing his his legacy, and uh, he's got a a great podcast and uh, a great website, so be sure and check that out. All right, so the next book, Who Moved My Cheese? An amazing, amazing... And amazingly <laughs> short. That's why I like it. I know. An amazing way to deal with change in your work and in your life. So this is by Dr. Spencer Johnson. It examines this idea of change through a parable. If you do not change, you become extinct. It's one of the many truisms that the characters learn in Who Move My Cheese. What's holding you back? Are you taking full note of the small changes that could lead to more significant changes? Or as you'll read in the book, are you just kind of hemming and hawing and 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 complaining about all of these these newfangled changes around you and not actively seeing these new changes and embracing them? Yeah, that that's that's one of the new classics of in business and 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 personal development. It, it's such a great lesson. Like just the, the the parable of it really hits home. Sometimes you need five hundred pages that are very literal and step by step, and sometimes you need just a, a few thousand uh, words that that can really teach a lesson and and make you see things totally differently. Yeah, I've referred back to this book a few times when uh, there have been kind of large scale changes at at the the company that I was at, remembering not to to get stuck in those. Well, that's not how we used to do it. Yeah, that's that's one of the the worst mindsets you can you can be in is is, this is, is how we've always done it. Um, how about, uh, how about this one by John Maxwell? I don't, we could put like a dozen John Maxwell books. Cause he uh, has, uh, yeah. Well, he has several dozen, uh, man, prolific. Uh, and he of course is a success ambassador, uh, columnist for, uh, success, uh, for, for almost a decade now. And the book that we'll cite here, it's on your list, Shelby, is Developing the Leader Within You. And, uh, it, it, it makes John's theories of leadership personal, for anybody struggling to take the next step in their career or who doubt 
their leadership abilities, this is the book that offers practical methods for developing leadership skills. And Maxwell defines leadership as influence, right? And he points out that a management title isn't a prerequisite to being a leader, regardless of your career, position, or personality. Um, you can learn how to be an effective leader. And the book sort of debunks the myth that uh, only an exclusive few are born to be leaders. Anyone uh, through self-discipline and, and mentorship and seeking mentors and adding to their own skills through training can become a leader. Yeah. You hit on something there about, um, it's actually a title of another book. Um, you don't need a title to be a leader, yeah. but that was something that one of the first things that I came across here at success magazine, really success partners. Um, I saw the title of that book and it's all title. I didn't read it, but the, premise was like, yeah, that's right. Like I, I kept on thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm just the lowly one on the totem pole. I can't say anything. I can't do anything to, to help exact change. But I realized, no, I can with setting the right example and, and, and thinking through that influence of how I can, I can show and demonstrate and then hopefully help lead others. A, a lot of these guys and gals who, who wrote the books on, on this list, are really impressive. But I got to say for me, shortly before I was promoted to editor-in-chief, I had the opportunity to sit down with John Maxwell for an interview uh, for a couple hours and just talk. And uh, it was for a story, but I sort of knew that I was about to be promoted. And so it really hit me beforehand the incredible opportunity I had to to just rap with this guy and ask him questions about leadership. And um, one of, one of my favorite days that I've had on the job here, it, it uh, was really helpful to me and, and, uh, it inspired me to read some more of his books. So, um, he's a great author. Good stuff. All right. Finally, rounding up this list, another favorite here is the chicken soup for the soul series. Oh yeah. This is of course by Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, um, along with many, many other contributors. I'm sure you've seen all the different incarnations of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. But the original Chicken Soup went to the top of this bestseller list in less than a year. And still today, one of the Chicken Soup books, any iteration of it, is currently listed and consistently there on the New York Times and other major bestseller lists. So these are unique because they've got thousands of, of, of just short little thought-provoking stories. Um, you know, it's a great way to warm your heart and it may help you see things through a different perspective. And of course, Jack Canfield is a great friend to success. He, um, we're lucky that he, he often shares some of the success content with us. And so we love the fact that after all of these many years, after all these many incarnations of chicken soup, everyone still has kind of their favorite. Yeah. Results don't lie. And when, when the book has been translated into, uh, you know, hundreds of languages, including Klingon, and, <laughs> uh, there's, there's basically a, a spinoff for, for, <laughs> for any demographic and any profession and any age group and way of life. Uh, it, it just goes to show that, that he was onto something there. Yep. Hey everybody, this is John Addison, the leadership editor of Success Magazine. Leadership is about personal development. You're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotten. You've got to get better every day. You've got to work on your thinking every day. I believe great leaders, they consume personal development. They are always about being better today than they were yesterday. And I believe the greatest resources are things like Success Magazine, which I'm proud to be a part of, because Success Magazine has a history, a legacy of being the cornerstone of personal development in America. So I believe, you know, resources like Success Magazine. I, I tell people all the time uh, that one of the great things to own is in, in my library where I'm sitting and doing this recording, I have book after book after book of great quotations. I believe sometimes when I'm struggling with a speech or struggling with something that I want to communicate, I will just open a book of great quotations of great leaders from history and just read those quotes because they're so full of knowledge and value that can make you a better person. Read history. 
Study history. Study leaders who changed the world. Read great biographies of great people. You need to work on your thinking. You need to work on your skills. Great leaders get better every single day. Great, 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 great stuff from John Addison as always. Hey, Shelby. Yeah. Can I just uh, sort of casually, conversationally let you know yes, that uh, the paperback version of Real Leadership, Nine Simple Practices for Leading and Living with Purposes, that's John's book, the paperback version will be available in March. All the better for sticking in my back pocket. Yeah. Just just telling you. Just you casually. Know, just, yeah. No, no, <laughs> NBD. No big deal. <laughs> Hey, Shelby, we got a uh, reader letter. We're reaching into the mailbag. We're reaching into the mailbag. We're always asking for you guys to holler at us at you at success.com. And we've been using those for all sorts of different purposes. Um, but uh, we have promised that we're going to read them on the show. And uh, let us wait no further. This one is from Ornella. And this is in response to our recent episode about habits for good decision making. She writes, Hi, Shelby and Josh. At work, I always have a priority Excel sheet based on Eisenhower's principle. It has four columns, urgent and important, non-urgent and important, urgent and not important, and not urgent and not important. And she says, as soon as a new task presents itself, I type it into the relevant column. The last two columns should always be empty. So there's never anything that should be not important that she's keeping track of. She says, this Excel sheet helps me to decide and keep a clear view on what I need to do and in which order. What also stimulates me about this sheet is that I color the task, which is done, and keep it in the sheet until the next morning. That way, I start the day content with all I accomplished yesterday. After the morning overview, I move the tasks to a second done sheet. Have a nice day, Ornella. That's a great tip. Yeah, I think that would make me have a nice day is to move things into a done sheet. Right, because you're starting the day. You're not starting with that big, long, intimidating to-do list, but you're reminding yourself, hey, I got some stuff accomplished yesterday, and, and let me try to make today just as good. You know what I like to do whenever I've, I've finished editing a, a story hmm. from one of our editors that kicked up to me what's that i like to ball it up yeah toss it over my shoulder <laughs> so shelby did i make my point at the very beginning of this uh this here episode about how books are a pretty good conversation starter a little better than the weather at least yeah i think so and um, it's actually been a really fun episode because we've we've opened people up to some great pathways, some things that they can take and they can learn about themselves and how they can grow. That's all with the power of uh, books. Books. Yeah. Maybe go to uh, a book fair at your local elementary school. They'll sell to you. There's one this you week. <laughs> just, just pretend like one of the kids there is your kid. Yeah, they'll, just walk in. I'll sell you a book. It, uh, don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how schools work. Um, how about this? Tell us your favorite personal development books, the books that have meant the most in your life. We would love to hear about them. Email your recommendations to you, Y-O-U, at success.com. Maybe we'll start a little success book club one of these days, Shelba. You're just full of good, great, good to great. Uh -huh. Get that? <laughs> full of good ideas. So um, you must read a lot, Josh. It's literally my job. Literally. Okay, that about does it. I'm Josh. And I'm Shelby. Don't forget to crack us open again next week. Bye-bye.